By now, you have already decided what you think of me. You've decided if you like me, respect me, if I know what I'm talking about, and you've decided if you're going to listen to what I have to say. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about first impressions. Now, first impressions tend to be about 76% accurate, and just to help you practice and become more aware of the information and assumptions and judgments you're making in a first impression, we're going to practice on me. So I'm going to throw out some adjectives, and I want you to raise your hand if that flashed through your mind when you saw me. Some will be positive, some will be negative. Please be honest. Not only is this ongoing feedback for me about the first impression I'm making, but I've heard the negative ones, and I've heard worse, and it really, really can't hurt my feelings. So please do be honest. So how many of you looked at me and thought, wow, she looks friendly? All right. How many of you thought she looks unfriendly? All right, not so many hands this time. How many of you thought she looks confident? How many of you thought maybe a little bit cocky? It happens, yeah, it does. How many of you thought she looks intelligent? How many of you thought she looks successful? How many of you thought she might be lesbian? In fact, my husband also thought I was lesbian when we first met. <laughs> so I can tell you from personal experience, when you make a not quite accurate first impression, you have to work a hundred times harder in order to get the result that you want. So when you first meet people, they will sort you into one of four different categories. But back to the four ways that people sort you when they first meet you. Have you ever met someone and instantly liked them? Raise your hand if that's happened to you. What's happening here is that your brain sees this person, sums them up, and decides that they fit into the category of friend. And it's not enough that someone seems friendly or that someone seems approachable. They have to be friendly and approachable and good for you personally. If you get the feeling that someone is friendly but isn't going to be able to help you in any way, you're not really going to sort them into the friend category. So in order to sort someone into the friend category, they have to be friendly, likable, approachable, and good for you personally. On the other hand, have you ever met someone and instantly disliked them? <laughs> All the nods there. So when that happens, your brain is summing someone up and seeing them as a threat. Technically, you sort them as a predator. That's the second category, predator. And this could be someone who's a threat to you physically. It could be someone who's a threat to you emotionally. Or it could be someone who's a threat to you socially, some kind of competition. Someone who will take resources and people away from you. But when that happens, you sum this person up and you immediately dislike them. And you can't put your finger on why. But it's my hope that after this presentation, whether someone makes a good first impression or a bad first impression, instead of being at the mercy of those quick judgments, you'll be able to, to pull those judgments apart and see why you judged them that way. The third category people are sorted into is the potential romantic partner category. Have you, yeah. Have you ever seen someone and thought, wow, they are so attractive, please ask me out? <laughs> If that's happened, then you've sorted this person into the potential romantic partner category. And your brain automatically does that even if you're not interested in a long-term relationship, even if you're happy with your current relationship, your brain just naturally picks up these people and sorts them into these categories. Now most of the people you meet won't fall into these three categories. They'll fall into the last category. This is where business relationships and friendships and sales conversations and promotions die. If you've failed in any of those areas, it is very likely that this is the root of your problem. The root of your problem is you're being sorted into the indifferent category. Have you ever met someone and forgotten their name? <laughs> Maybe forgotten their face? Forgotten what they do? forgotten they exist. All of those are cues that you have sorted this person into the indifferent category. And if that's ever happened to you, 
that's a good sign that people are sorting you into the indifferent category too. Now it's, it's not a sad ending. You're not stuck with that forever. What I want to do today is teach you some skills so that you get out of the indifferent category and into whatever category you want to be into. Any questions about this before we get started? All right, then let's get started. So how do you want people to see you? What are some character traits that you want people to assume about you when they first meet you? Could you just throw some out? You don't have to raise your hand. Friendly, confident. Friendly, confident. Anything else? Approachable. Professional, good. What else? Approachable. Approachable. Anything Trust else? Trustworthy. Those are the big ones. Friendly, approachable, those are kind of the same thing. Confident or competent, professional, and trustworthy. These are the big things that people want to achieve. This is how you want to be seen. And if you're falling into the indifferent category, you're missing out on several of those areas. So let's start out with how you can be seen as more confident. Now, before I get into that, I want to tell you about this interesting relationship between likability and competence. And it's not, when we're judging by people's outer appearance, we don't really judge them by what they truly are. We judge them by what they appear to be. So if you've ever met someone who made a great first impression and said, oh yeah, I'll totally follow up with you on this, and then doesn't, that is an example of their first impression not matching up with their reality. On the other hand, this is the category that most of you fall into. Most of you fall into the category of, on the back end, you are hardworking. You are determined. You are friendly and approachable and kind. You are all the things. But maybe on the outside, you're not quite conveying that to the, to the outside world. Which means even though you really are professional and trustworthy and approachable and confident, on the outside, people don't see that. So when it comes to appearing more confident, one of the easiest things you can do is actually changing the way you sit and stand. Now I want you to like freeze for a moment and just notice how much space you're taking up. Notice your pose. Are your arms touching your sides or are they spreading out onto the table or chairs around you? Are your feet and knees touching or are they spreading out to the, to the area around you? Are you sitting up straight? or you may be hunched over a little bit. Notice what you're doing in this moment, because we're about to change it. So when it comes to how much space you're taking up, this actually is crucial for telling people what they should think about you. Uh, Science of People did an interesting study, or they found an interesting study about this posing. They studied Olympic athletes who were seeing and who were blind blind, who had never seen anyone win or lose a race. And they found when these athletes lost, they would all shrink down into this low power pose where their arms would press against their sides, their feet would press together, and they would slump over. And they found when they won, they would all expand into this more triumphant pose. They would take a wider stance. They would even throw their arms into the air. They would puff out their chests. And they did that even if they had never seen anyone else win or lose a race. And what this tells us is that our bodies are constantly, innately, communicating with the people around us. These are universal cues where no matter where you go, they mean the same thing. There may be a little bit of a difference in cultural context, but basically they mean the same thing. Now I want you to work with me, sitting as you are, into a low power pose so you know what it feels like and you know what not to do. So I want you to make sure your legs and your feet are touching. You can have them crossed or just pressed together, but make sure they are touching. Shrink, shrink, shrink. Yes, like that. <laughs> then I want you to take your shoulders and bring them up towards your ears. Maybe you're a little bit nervous or tense. This is what we naturally do when we're anxious. Now I want you to press your elbows against your sides. You can clutch your hands in your lap or you can fold them across, however you like. Now I want you to, to tuck your chin down so you're looking down. How does this feel? Ugly. Ugly. <laughs> Ugly. Yeah. This is not a great feeling. This is, this is what we do when we're cold. It's a sign of discomfort. 
This is also something we do when we're feeling nervous, when we're feeling unprepared, when we're feeling like we're about to get in trouble. And this is what we do when we are actually broadcasting to the people around us, don't notice me, I'm not a threat, just glance over me. This pose is an invitation to be sorted into the indifferent category. It literally tells people not to bother you, not to notice you, just to leave you alone. Now, most of you aren't sitting in your meetings like, <laughs> but I want you to notice every time you pull out your phone and check it, instead of being like this, you bend over into this. And this is pretty close to that low power pose. And I was taught to sit like a lady by my mom, which meant I would sit with my legs crossed, my hands in my lap, and my stuff clustered around me so it wasn't in anyone's way. And you'll notice I am a lot closer to the low power end of the spectrum here. This is only a few movements away from this. See, this, not so bad, this, pretty bad. So some of you are thinking like, oh, no, I don't want to hear this. But the truth is, you tell people how to see you. You tell them if you are confident and capable. And if you're sending a message that says, I don't know what I'm talking about, you can work so hard that you make up for that message. But it is so much easier to just send the message you want to send in the first place instead of having to change people's minds about you. So let's move over to the high power posing. And those of you in skirts, uh, just comp if you can't spread out with your legs, compensate by spreading out with your arms instead. So what I want you to do is take a wide stance with your legs. You've seen this, like if you have sons or teenagers, when they're disrespecting you, they spread out like this. Yeah. So you take a wide stance with your legs, throw your shoulders back, and if you can, spread an arm out across the table or the chair next to you. Yeah. How does this feel? Cocky. Cocky. What else does it feel? Comfortable. <laughs> this is literally, I am at ease. There are no threats here and I am in control. That's really what you're saying with this body language. What else does it feel like? I noticed most of you couldn't help but smile when we did this. It feels good. This is literally saying, I am totally at ease. There are no threats here. And you'll often notice, I'm about to be very disrespectful, please forgive me. Uh, you'll often notice, sometimes if someone's sprouting out, like putting their, if you've ever seen a colleague yeah. spread out like this, as soon as the boss walks into the room, what do they do? Straight up. <laughs> Hi, sir. That's because only the biggest and most important person in the room gets to spread out like that. Because what you're really doing is you're claiming territory from the people around you. If you are shrunk into that low power pose, you're saying, I have no territory, I'm not a threat, you can ignore me. But if you're spreading out into this wide, high power pose, you're saying, I'm a big deal. Notice me, pay attention to me, listen to me. And so I'm not suggesting that you walk into each meeting and <laughs> sprawl out, take up two or three chairs on your way. But I do want you to be aware of how much space you're taking up. If you're one of those people who instinctively spreads out and takes up more space, well, you heard from the room, people see that as cocky, overconfident, or even arrogant. But if you're one of those people who's taking up less space, shrinking down like this, you heard from the room, people see that as anxious, or shy, or nervous. So the best thing to do is somewhere in the middle. And this is called the launch stance. And all of these stances that I've had you practice sitting, you can also do this standing. The same principles apply. But in the launch stance, your feet are basically shoulder width apart. Your shoulders are back. Your chin is in the air. And you just keep track of your elbows. You can have them resting on the chair next to you, resting on your hip, resting on the table. You just want to make sure you are claiming up a full chair, even up to two chairs. Whereas cocking is anything in the three chair range. <laughs> but if you feel like your size is an issue, like you don't want to spread out, like you're nervous of, how, of your size, sometimes people in that situation will shrink down even more because they don't want to take up too much space. And that is the absolute last thing you should do. Instead, instead of comparing how much space you take up compared to other people in the room, 
you want to notice how much space you take up versus how much you could take up. Measure yourself as chairs. You don't have to use the chairs around you as reference. Anyway, so what I want you to do, I want you to remember back to when I had you freeze and notice what you were doing. How many of you were closer to the low power end of the spectrum by show of hands? All right, several of you. It's typical for women are more likely to fall into that low power pose. It's just a stereotype, but it's fairly typical. How many of you were falling more to the high power end of the spectrum? Have I lost any of you at any point during this presentation? Any questions? Any of you thinking I'm crazy? She has no idea what she's talking about. If, I really do love to, to talk about this, so if you have any questions at any time, please do jump in. It would make me very happy to answer. But that is how you appear as more confident and more competent in your interactions. You want to walk in confidently claiming your space. Now let's move on to how you can be seen as more trustworthy. So for this presentation, I, I want you to tell me, what do you think people notice first when they meet you? What do they look at first when they meet you? Any guesses? Smile. Smile. That's Eyes. a common guess. Your area. Eyes. Eyes. Common guess. Your area. Your, just Your like space. a whole kind of Your whole space. picture. All right. What else do you think people might look at? How you're dressed. How you're dressed. Now, these are all things people notice, but for a split fraction of a second, they look somewhere else first. Any guesses? Shoes. Shoes. Shoe. I hear that one all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I want you to think of a police officer. What does the police officer want to see when he meets you? Hands. <laughs> want to see your hands. <laughs> so why do you think that is? Why do we want to see people's hands? Oh, you're about to shake your hand, right? All right, you'll notice every greeting ritual in the world is designed to show your hands, whether it's a handshake, wave, even bowing. You put your hands in a designated place. And in hugs, you actually get to pat the other person down. So all of our greeting rituals are designed to show the hands. <clears throat> but why are they so important? What do hands do? They could hit or hug, so you're looking at. Like our three. hands show intention. Yeah. But, uh, all right, let me tell you a story that might illustrate this for you. There was a, a video on YouTube about a gentleman in a hoodie who was checking out at a Subway store. His sandwich was being made across the counter, and he was moving through the line with his hands in his hoodie pockets. And he was moving through the line, no big deal, until he got to the cash register. And they rang up his order, and the cash register opened, and he pulled out a gun. <clears throat> with this in mind, why do we want to see people's hands? We want to stay safe. Our brain's number one priority is staying alive. It wants to stay alive as long as possible. You are here because your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents for thousands of generations stayed alive long enough to pass on their genes. Your brain is a survival expert machine. You have all the information you need about the world's most dangerous predator, other humans. So there are certain things your brain instinctively looks for in other people to make sure it's safe to approach. And one of those most important cues are people's hands. An interesting study uh, studied jurors and defendants. And they found jurors looking at defendants saw defendants who had their hands under the table, out of sight, as more sneaky, untrustworthy, and deceitful, just because they had their hands out of sight. Now, how do you think those trials ended for those defendants? Probably not a happy ending for the defendant. But you are on trial with your clients all the time. You have a lot of competition which means your potential clients and your current clients are always in the back of their minds wondering if they made the right choice to work with you, wondering if you are the best deal or if there are other options out there. And you are on trial for their business. Maybe you're in a meeting with your boss and you're on trial for a promotion. Maybe you're at home talking with your significant other and you're on trial for their attention, but not sure if they're getting what they need or want from you. 
you are always on trial with the people around you. Now, you're probably not going to be sent to prison in this trial, but you do have the opportunity to either get what you want or not. And one of the best ways to make sure you're conveying what you want to and getting the result that you want to is to always keep your hands visible. Now, I notice some of you are doing this already. Some of you are sitting with your hands in your laps, which is normal. I used to do that all the time. But hands in your lap, under the table, out of sight, means people are subconsciously wondering what you're hiding. Maybe they're not getting the full story. And so you don't want people's brains to be wondering that during your presentation. You don't want them to be wondering what you're hiding, what you're holding back, what you're not telling them. So you always want to make sure your hands are visible. It's especially important when you're meeting someone or walking into the meeting. Now, I would say you should have them visible 100% of the time, but at least have them visible during that first interaction where you're meeting them. Handshake, cheek kiss, hug, whatever you're doing, make sure your hands are out and visible. Now, a great place to practice this is whenever you're ordering food. If you walk up to a counter and you're ordering food, that's a great place to practice keeping your hands visible instead of shoved into your pockets or folded or tucked away under something. And most of the time, people are like, I'm not sure what to do with my hands. Pockets are comfortable. Why can't I, what should I do with my hands now that they're out of the pockets? Well, you can have them resting at your sides. I've done this several times during the presentation, and it doesn't really look weird. What I, what I usually do if I'm meeting someone or walking up to speak to someplace, I'll just kind of hold my hands here. As I'm walking up and I'll order, I'll be like, hey, can I get this and this and this? And nobody thinks that's weird. Maybe you can do a little steeple, or maybe you can do the Angela Merkel diamond. You can have a hand on your hip. You can be carrying something on your shoulder, hold it here. Maybe you're holding something in your arm. Whatever you do, find ways to keep your hands visible and you will be surprised at the results. Any questions about hands so far? It was so hard, so hard. I would be folding, and then I'd be like, okay, I'm trying to break this habit, and I'd put my hands at my sides, and I'd be like, on the outside, I'd look totally cool, fine. On the inside, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so awkward, don't like this, don't like this, ah! <laughs> and then I finally, like, I'd calm down, and I'd relax, and by the time I relaxed, I'd realize, oh, I'm feeling confident and comfortable because I'm folding my arms again. <laughs> so when you try to break a body language habit, it is very difficult. And there are three stages you'll go through in this process. The first one, you're in right now. You're building awareness. Awareness of what your body is doing and awareness of what you want it to be doing <laughs> instead. Then you get to the next phase where you actually try to make a change. And this stage is called discomfort. And in this stage, this is where you try and you fail. And you try and it feels awkward, so you stop. And you keep trying. And just like going back to the gym after a long time of not working out, you get sore muscles. It hurts. It's uncomfortable. You don't like it. It's the exact same with your brain. Because you're literally building up muscles in your brain about these body language habits. But discomfort is the phase where most people quit. And most people actually hire me as a coach to help get them through the discomfort phase. So they have targeted feedback, they have targeted strategies and solutions to help them over their unique challenges. But if you stick to it through the discomfort phase, eventually you get to the mastery phase, where things that you used to struggle with now are natural and easy. And when it comes to hand gestures, I am in this phase now. I used to really struggle with my hand gestures, but I practice and I practice and I've been practicing, oh, let's see, how long has it been? It's been over seven years since I started trying to break my, my bad body language folded arms habit. And I don't have that habit anymore. Hopefully it won't take you quite so long, but if you need any help in this process, that's actually something I do want to help people with. But back to your question, why are hand gestures so, not actually related to your question, but I'm going to answer it anyway because I think it's cool. Uh, some people are wondering why hand gestures, not just visible hands, 
but hand gestures are important. And to do this, Science of People did a really cool study. How many of you have heard of TED Talks? TED Talks, right? All right. So the, for those of you who haven't heard, TED Talks are short, 20 minutes or less speeches by experts in their field. And uh, Science of People compiled all of the TED Talks from 2010 to 2011 and studied them to see why some TED Talks went viral and why some had only a few hundred or a few thousand views. And what they found was that the most popular TED Talks used twice as many hand gestures per minute as the least popular TED Talks. So, if you want to be more interesting, more charismatic, more engaging, and go viral, you want to use more hand gestures. Now, I am going to caution you, because when I teach this, sometimes, when I started teaching this, sometimes people would assume that it, their hand gestures had to be like super scripted, out in advance, and they would end up with something that was almost like interpretive dancing. <laughs> so they would come up with something like, my heart can hear what you are saying to me. <laughs> And that's not what I want you to do. <laughs> that's more like American Sign Language. Like, hand gestures are just there to illustrate what you're talking about. They're not the whole story. They're just there to add another dimension to the conversation. Any questions? All right. Then let's move on to another part of your first impression. How many of you have heard that eye contact is important? Mm -hmm. Don't know about you, that was something my mother told me all the time. Eye contact is important. Make eye contact. And uh, for those of you who don't know, growing up, my parents actually thought I was slightly autistic because I had such a hard time talking to people and connecting to people, making a good first impression, making any connection at all. I always seemed to say the wrong thing if I managed to say anything at all. So growing up, I was very, very isolated. And it was only my family who I was really friends with. And having six siblings, you know, it's not like I didn't have any friends. But it was really hard for me to connect with anyone outside of the family. So my mom, wanting me to be able to make friends and, and fit in, she got me this book. Uh, she started getting me books on people skills. I started out with uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People for Teenage Girls. And it came with a pink cover and everything. And that was just the, the first step in the long line of books that I've started reading to try and understand people. Well, eventually, I found a book on body language, and I still have that book to this day, even though it, it's, it kind of sucks. But this book talked about eye contact. And in this book, it mentioned that you should make as much eye contact as comfortable because it releases oxytocin in the brain, chemicals, hormones, bonding, etc., etc. But the key point was, make as much eye contact as comfortable. Now, for anyone else, this may have sufficed. But for me, my very awkward, untrained self, I took that as make as much eye contact as possible. <laughs> so using this skill in high school, trying to get a boyfriend, here's how it worked. I would look at these boys, and they would look at me, and they would look away. And I would keep looking at them, <laughs> waiting for them to turn and see what magical eye contact we had. <laughs> How do you think that worked out for me? Not too good. Not too good at all. As all of you know, how, what does it feel like when someone's staring at you? Stalking. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy. Creepy. Maybe even aggressive. Yeah. That's how we feel when we get too much eye contact. On the other hand, how do you feel when someone doesn't give you any eye contact? Let me ignore. give ignore it. A situation you may be familiar with at home. You're talking to your significant other, yeah. and they are turned away, facing something like maybe the TV, and you're over here talking at them, and they're like, uh huh, uh huh, and you're not getting any eye contact. Do you think they're really listening? No. No. You already know that. So, now we've got these two opposites. Too much eye contact is creepy and aggressive. Not enough eye contact is avoidant or ignoring us. But here's where it gets really, really tricky. And this is something I learned when I was formally certified by the Science of People, who for those of you who don't know, they're a private human behavior research lab. And they've compiled over 2,500 studies on body language to bring information about nonverbal communication to, to people like you. It used to be that only uh, 
only scientists and researchers were studying body language, and it used to be that only bigwig politicians or federal agents were the ones using body language. But Science of People brought that body language to trainers like me, so we could teach it to everyone, as many people as possible. But what, this, what they found is that different cultures actually have different eye contact norms, in which you may have noticed, especially here in Hawaii. And the only, the only group that's been formally studied and found a percentage for eye contact norms is mainland America, the United States. And so what they found for the mainland, that is the ideal range of eye contact, is between 60 to 70% eye contact. So that's making eye contact about two thirds of the time. And you'll notice this is a little different if, depending on if you're speaking or if you're listening. If you're speaking, you tend to make less eye contact, even closer to 40% eye contact. Whereas if you're listening, your eye contact goes all the way up to about 80% eye contact. But on average, we teach that on mainland America, you should make about, you should make eye contact, eye contact about two thirds of the time. But when you get here to the islands, that's pretty tricky. Or if you go outside the United States, it's pretty tricky. Now there aren't formal numbers on other eye contact culture norms, but my clients tell me that here in Hawaii, if you are, if you meet someone who is from Japan or even from Korea, they might give eye contact that's closer to 20 to 30 percent eye contact or even less. And this means that when you have people from two different cultures coming together, they, there's already a clash. There's already miscommunications happening. Because within two or three seconds, one of them feels like the other person is staring at them, being aggressive, being creepy, stalkerish. And the other person feels like this person isn't looking at them at all. They're being ignored. They're disinterested. They don't actually care even though both sides are just trying to be respectful and give what they think is ideal eye contact. So when it comes to eye contact, the best thing you can possibly do is notice what the other person is doing and send that back to them. And this is something where, this is probably the only presentation you'll be in in your life where someone will actually tell you to do this. But I'm gonna do it anyway because it's useful, even though it may be incredibly offensive and I apologize for that. One of the best things you can do in order to give good eye contact is to stereotype people. Stereotype people, guess what their culture is, and start there. So if you look at someone and you think, you know what, that, this person looks like they're a, a white guy from the mainland. I'm going to start out by giving them about two-thirds eye contact. I'm going to start out there. Or if you look at someone and you think, wow, this businesswoman, she looks like she's from Asia. I think she sounds like she's Japanese, so I'm going to start out giving her very, very little eye contact. And yeah, you're stereotyping, and people tell you you shouldn't do that. But in this instance, stereotyping gives you a starting place so that you know where to start out with your eye contact, and then within 10 to 15 seconds, you've figured out what their eye contact really is, and then you can go up to the next level, which is meeting them where they are. So, so honesty check, how many of you have I horribly, horribly offended? Not too bad? No. Alright. If, if I did offend you, please feel free to like throw something at me so I actually know. It would be very helpful for me to know. Alright, but that is eye contact. That's how you make sure you're giving the right amount of eye contact. Any questions? Then we will move into the super, super cool, my favorite part of eye contact, which is, did you know your eyes actually make different patterns on people's faces? and you make different patterns on their faces based on how you feel about them. And even cooler, even cooler, you can change the way they're feeling, you can change their emotional state in that moment by changing the type of eye pattern you're using. How many of you would like to learn that? <laughs> All right, this is my favorite, favorite thing to teach. So, eye contact is super cool because we instinctively read and react to what other people are doing. So you remember those, those four categories that we sort people into when we need them? The friend, predator, romantic partner, or indifferent? There are eye contact patterns for each of these. Although for indifferent, what people do is basically not look at you at all. So, you know, we've covered that. That ever happened to you? Alright, this is the eye gaze you want to use when that happens. 
This is an eye pattern that teachers use on students, parents use on children, superiors use on subordinates, and I first practiced this on my husband. <laughs> so, I read about this gaze, I, I saw it in use in the Science of People training, and I wanted to see it in real life. So, I found a prime time to practice it. My husband and I were having an argument, and he's, he's actually a big guy. So when, when he's angry or upset, he kind of gets wider, and he kind of like looms over you, and his voice gets loud and deep. So you can tell from all of that, from his body language, he's actually saying, I am in control. So I brought out the power gaze, and I noticed within two seconds, he went from this, he took a step back and shrunk down. Within two seconds, I got this reaction, using the power gaze. So the power gaze, what this looks like, is when you're looking at someone else's face, you focus on these three areas, and you cycle between them. The areas you look at are this eye, this eye, and the forehead. You just switch between eye, eye, forehead. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a very, very powerful tool. But you'll notice when you power gaze someone, they will have one of two reactions. They will give in, or they will fight harder. And what I found with my husband is after I used the power gaze one too many times, he figured it out. <laughs> and so he then would start power gazing back. And if you were to turn and look at your neighbor, you would, and you were to power gaze them, you would feel a little bit of tension. You will feel a little bit of struggle. And for those of you who are, who are in tune with your feelings, it would feel very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> because what's going on in your head as you are, when you're power gazing someone else, you're saying, I am in control. But when someone else starts power gazing you back, then you get into this power struggle, which is very, very uncomfortable. So, when I, when I was arguing with my husband and I power gazed him and he started power gazing me back, I knew I had to change strategies. And so I had, I had an idea about the way to use the, the first gaze, which is the social gaze, something you use for friends. And I thought, you know what? I wonder if this is something that would calm him down in this moment. And so I pulled out the social gaze. The social gaze is something we instinctively use on friends, peers, equals, people we actually like. People where, when we're having a good conversation with someone and we really like them and we, we feel like this is a great connection, we instinctively use the social gaze. And I've seen it happen where I'm introduced to someone, and as I'm walking over, I can see they've got really tense shoulders, their, their body is, is close, tight together, and they seem anxious. And so I get over there, and I shake their hand, and I give them the social gaze as I look at them, and I've seen their shoulders actually relax. So the social gaze is very powerful, and it's something you instinctively already use in some situations. But I want you to use this one more deliberately. Because what I found talking to my husband, when we were engaged in a power struggle of power gaze versus power gaze, as soon as I started using the social gaze, he went from this to this. And it completely relaxed him. So this is something you can use when you're dealing with difficult clients, upset clients, nervous clients, your boss, someone you want to like you, someone you want to relax. So the social gaze is when you look at someone's eyes and their mouth. Eye, eye, mouth. And some, I've had this happen where a couple people in the audience like panic about looking at people's mouths. So if that's you, fine, go to, go to the nose, go to the chin, but find these anchor points and use them as you're looking at people. So I'm going to come around and I'm going to social gaze you and I want you to look for, for the dip when my eyes look down to your mouth. And I want you to recognize that, look for it, so that the next time it happens to you, you can see it. Yeah. yeah. A little bit? Happier. Yeah. Seemed happier, what else? <clears throat> Maybe a little more relaxed, not so big deal. So if you've, if you've ever been in a situation where someone seems intimidated by you, afraid of you, or just emotionally upset in any kind of way, the social gaze is something you can just give to them, and it can help them relax. So it's actually a really good indicator that you've established rapport with someone, when they start to, to social gaze you back. So when you're talking to someone, 
and you notice their eyes dipping down, like it did when I looked at you, eye, eye, mouth, dipping down to your mouth, one of two things has happened. One, you've established rapport. Congratulations. Two, you have something in your teeth. <laughs> Could go either way. But those are the two gazes that you can use kind of as a carrot and as a stick if you're dealing with a difficult client or you're going through any type of interaction. When you need to be an authority, when you need to be listened to, you bring out the power gaze. And when you want to soften that interaction, be more of a friend, be more of a soothe, then you bring out the social gaze. And studies have found when you social gaze someone right as you're shaking your hand, and you go eye, eye, mouth right as you shake their hand, it's actually much, much more effective than any other kind of greeting. Because what you're saying with your hand, you're giving them a dose of oxytocin. With your eyes, you're giving them a dose of oxytocin. And your eyes are telling their brain that you like them, that you're a friend. And you may not know this, but a good handshake is worth three hours of face-to-face -face conversation. So that packs a really good punch in your first impression. So any questions about anything we've covered so far? What is a good handshake? Ooh, that is a really good question. Now, I grew up in a very small, somewhat redneck town on the mainland. So for us, the best handshake was a long, hard, like several pumps, handshake where you're trying to break the other person's fingers. <laughs> Once I got out into the real world and started giving my ideal handshake to others, I was surprised that it was not always well received. <laughs> so if you've ever had someone tell you, my, what a firm handshake, <laughs> yeah. that is a clue your handshake is a little bit on the hard side. On the other hand, have you ever gone to shake someone's hands and just gotten their fingers? <laughs> That's a clue. You might be on the opposite end of the spectrum. Have you ever, have you ever heard it called the limp fish? <laughs> yeah. Now, from some cultures, the limp fish is just how it is. It's just what they do. But, again, this is where stereotyping is helpful in guessing what kind of handshake people are going to give you. Because if someone, let's say some, a businesswoman from Japan comes to Hawaii, and a businessman from mainland America comes to Hawaii, and they are meeting each other at a networking event and they're shaking hands. Each of them is going to give what they think is an ideal handshake. And let me ask you, what do you assume when someone gives you a bone-crushing handshake? What do you think about them? Controlling. Cocky, controlling. Anything else? Obnoxious. Obnoxious. <laughs> Maybe overcompensating, a little bit dominant. It, it can be a little bit scary. On the other hand, what do you assume when someone gives you the limp fish handshake, where they reach in, barely touch your hand, and then pull back? Like they don't yeah. even want to bother. They don't, they don't, they don't even touched. want to bother. They don't want to be touched. They don't like you. They think you're diseased. Your brain goes through all of these different conclusions. And so when this businesswoman from Japan and this mainland American businessman meet, she is going to give a very light, soft, gentle handshake. He is going to give a very firm, powerful, confident handshake. And each of them is going to form a very, very bad first impression of the other. So the ideal handshake is somewhere in the middle, where it's firm but not too firm. Usually you do it for, for two or three shakes, and that's the ideal handshake. You want to do it vertical. Uh, when someone reaches out and shakes their hand like this, this is like saying, give me that, I'm in control, or even kiss the ring. This is a very dominant handshake. <laughs> On the other hand, when someone reaches out like this, it's a very submissive, may I please have some? You're in control here. It's a very submissive handshake. That's why you want to instinctively start out with a vertical handshake. But like I said, stereotyping is very helpful in assuming how someone is going to start their handshake. And then, after the first pump, you learn if you're right or if you're wrong, and you turn to meet them where they are. But that stereotype at least gives you a starting place, so you're more likely to get the right handshake. Any questions about that? So it depends on how you want to make the other person feel. If you want to make them feel like you really care about them, the handshake hug is a great way to go. If you want to make it a little more intimate, yeah, you can do a touch on the upper arm, you can do a touch on the elbow. But whenever you like grab the other person's arm or you grab their elbow, then it's a little more like, I'm being controlled. This is uncomfortable. 
So handshake and a light touch on either is a great way to go. How many of you want to actually practice your handshakes? All right, I want you to turn and shake your neighbor's hand and ask them what they think about your handshake. There's always more to learn. And you covered three different skills today. Normally when I come in, you've only had me for an hour. But normally when I come in, we have a two, three, even four hour workshop. So there's so much more to teach you. But today I'd like to have you walk away with two gifts for me. Because I know a one and done workshop isn't always the best thing in helping you actually implement these changes. So the first thing I'm going to pass around, I'm offering you a free 30 minute coaching call. And it's, it's free, it's, I'm not trying to offer you anything. I really want to help you master and, and take advantage of the skills you've learned today. I want you to, to overcome these challenges. I want to help you get through the discomfort phase. So I'm passing this around. If, you want, if you're interested, go ahead and sign up. I just need your name and your email. And please write legibly because I'll be the one interpreting these, so please make it so I can see it. And as that's going around, I also want you to pull out your phones. How many of you have profile pictures on LinkedIn? Most of you have some kind of profile picture. Well, with what we covered today, your profile picture is your digital first impression. People make assumptions about you based on that profile picture. And that, those assumptions mean they either stick with you or they click away to find someone else. So to help you, I, I put together a really quick checklist of do's and don'ts for your profile picture, mostly based on body language. And if you want to get that, again, that's a little free bonus for you. You can pull out your phone and you can text the number 38470. That's 38470. And when you've got that message open, you'll send the word extra, E-X-T-R-A. So you'll text the word extra to the number 38470, and it will send you a link and give you all the directions to go and get that free profile picture guide. <coughs> but I see we are ending right on time. If you have any questions, I'll be in the back corner. Thank you.